My name is Forrest Smith and I'm the Public Information Officer for the Mesa Fire Department and welcome to What's on Fire. Coming up in this edition, cooking fires. They're the leading cause of home fires and home fire injuries in the United States, according to the United States Fire Administration. But first, as the summer comes to a close and we start the beginning of a new school year, let's take a look at what parents and drivers could do to ensure that our children make it to school safely. Joining me is Public Information Officer for the Mesa Police Department, Steve Berry. Steve, thanks for joining me. Forrest, how are you doing? Oh, very good, thank you. Hey, now Steve, I see we're right here in front of Mesa Junior High School, and we've got a busy street in front of us here. Very busy street. This is Broadway Road, a very busy street here in Mesa. Junior High right on the street, lots and lots of traffic every day. Okay, so Steve, I know right here, the speed limit typically is 35 during the regular part of the year or outside of school hours, but I noticed we're next to a sign that shows 15 miles per hour. Talk a little bit about this. That's correct, Forrest. What we've got here is one of the standard school signs uh, for any school zone you'd see in town. It's clearly indicating that the speed limit is 15 miles per hour, and also very important on this sign, across the top it says no passing. We certainly don't want someone to come out and try and pass another vehicle and uh, strike a child who's walking through the crosswalk. Now, also I see in protecting our children, I I see we have another tool that we use to help make sure our children make it to school safely. Talk a little bit about that. That's correct. What we've got here is one of our Mesa motorcycle officers and as you can see he's here working uh, a LIDAR which is a speed detection device um, through the school zone. Okay. Now tell me something. We've seen people drive through here fast even when you do have the presence of a police officer here. What are the consequences if I'm coming through here and ignoring the law? If you've got a situation where a person is simply not paying attention or, or ignoring the speed limits, uh, the minimum fines for that are about $245, and they could be up to double that depending upon the circumstances. Uh, more importantly than that, though, is the safety of the students. We just don't want uh, our students being in jeopardy. Right. Now, I see that we also have another tool back here, which is something that we've grown up with. There's a crosswalk over here. Correct. The crosswalk there, um, during the school year, when the crossing signs are out, you'll find that there's crossing guards. Um, adults at all of those intersections. Um, they're covered in the reflective gear to uh, indicate where they're at and they've also got the stop signs in hand. When approaching a crosswalk you should already be slowing down because of the school zone and once that stop sign is displayed by that crossing guard you need to stop prior to the crosswalk and that will allow the children to safely get across the street. Okay now Steve switching gears just a little bit here. I've sent my children my child off to school. Is there anything that I could do to protect them as far as helping me or somebody else be able to identify them if they get on the wrong bus or if they happen to get lost headed to school? Certainly, we always want to uh, try and get our kids ready for school. And by ready for school, that's not only getting dressed every day, but mentally ready. Um, have those kids prepared. Have them looking out for cars. Um, be aware of what your child's wearing that day. If something were to happen, at least you know what uh, the information you can give us at the police department to help locate them. Another issue regarding school time. We have school buses busy streets, a lot of times you'll see a bus come to a stop. Talk to us a little bit about that. That's correct. On a lot of these busy streets, depending upon where the pickup location is, a school bus may stop on a major thoroughfare. Generally, you'll see the yellow uh, flashing lights come on first, followed by the red flashing lights on the school bus at the same time that the stop arms extend. Once those stop arms extend, it is illegal for you to pass that school bus. You need to stop. Um, that allows time for the children to get on the bus. Kids aren't always thinking greatly. They'll dart out across the street. So even if you're going in the opposing direction and you see those stop arms out, that stop does mean stop. Steve, thank you very much for that valuable information. No problem. As you can see, it's important to drive slowly when taking your kids to school, but it's also important to make sure you have the proper car seat available for them. Now let's go join our Fire and Life Safety Education Specialist to discuss this more in detail. Joining me is Marisa Ramirez Ramos. She's a Fire and Life Safety Education Specialist. Marisa, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, Marisa, I see here that we have a bunch of car seats. How important is it to use a car seat? It's really important. Um, car crashes are actually the number one killer of children between the ages of three and 14. So that's how important it is. Um, and there's really three different phases that a child needs to be in a car seat before they transition into the vehicle seat belt. So the first phase would be for infants. This is a rear facing only car seat. Um, you try to have your child in a rear facing seat until they're two years old. The next phase would be uh, what we call a convertible seat. It's rear facing as well as forward facing. This would be for a case where a child um, reaches the maximum weight and height limit of their infant carrier but isn't ready to go forward facing. So this seat can be transitioned from a rear facing seat and then easily 
flipped over to stand up a lot straighter and taller to be a forward facing seat. Let me go through a little bit of the fit while we have our baby doll in here. Um, you want this inner harness to be nice and tight. You have directions right here on the plastic clip that says place at armpit level. So we have it right in the center of the chest at armpit level. When a child is rear facing, it's really important that these harness straps be equal or below their shoulder. And it's different when it's forward facing. You want it equal or above the shoulder. Another way to test this harness and make sure that it's tight enough is to actually try to pull a piece of the harness and loop between your fingers. If I can do this, the harness is not tight enough. So I need to go ahead and pull the harness and get it tighter. The last phase for a car seat would be for bigger kids, and this is a booster seat. This seat actually goes to 100 pounds. Um, by law in Arizona, a child needs to be in a car seat until their fifth birthday, but it's very rare that a five-year-old would be 100 pounds. So a child could use this way beyond, as long as they're within the height and weight limit of the booster seat. A couple of final things that I wanna show you really quick are, Every car seat has labels and the labels are really important because that tells you the manufacture date, it tells you the name of the model, the model number, as well as the expiration date. A lot of people don't realize that car seats actually expire. So you can see right here, this was manufactured in 2010 and it expires in 2016. So it only has a shelf life of six years. Oh, wow. Now, Benisa, it's pretty interesting to me because we see our children grow fast. Next thing you know, they're starting off in these car seats, they're working way through these car seats, but then they become more independent. Next thing we know, they're riding bicycles and such. Let's talk a little bit about bike helmets and other helmets for activities. Okay, perfect. We have our helmet board here displaying various models of helmets. Um, we have a typical baseball helmet, a multi-sport helmet that could be used for various sports. This is a ski helmet. Uh, this helmet is for while you're riding horses and then a bicycle helmet. A couple of the most important things is that your child use a helmet and they use it every time. And the way that you can encourage that as a parent is actually bringing your child with you when you purchase the helmet. If they're invested in the helmet and they like the helmet, it's more likely that they're going to wear the helmet. A couple of things about fit. When the helmet is on a child's head, you only want one to two fingers above, above the brow line where this helmet is sitting nice and straight on the head. This you want actually to come to a Y and be right around their ear. And the helmet needs to be secured. A lot of kids will put a helmet on and then won't buckle it. Well, that's really defeating the purpose. So you want this buckled nice and tight and you just want one finger to come underneath the chin, between the chin and this strap. Um, helmets can actually reduce uh, severe brain injury 88% if they're worn correctly. So that's a great statistic. So that's why wearing a helmet is so important. Okay, so with that said, we have no helmet law for adults we know. Is there a helmet law for kids? No, there isn't a helmet law in Arizona, but it's something that we obviously stress for children. Uh, just because the law says you don't have to, safety tells us that you do. Oh, that's great. Marisa, thank you very much. It's excellent information. Thanks for having me. Once the kids are home, it's almost time for dinner. It's said that the kitchen is the heart of the home, but did you know it could be also the most dangerous place? We're gonna show you ways you can protect yourself and your loved ones from the number one cause of fire in homes. Stay tuned. 